I think we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, I see a lot of people are filtering in, so um, get yourself comfortable. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you might be in the world. And welcome to this, our first guest presentation for AI Academy 2024. I'm Sean Michael Morris. I'm the Vice President of Academics at Course Hero and one of the facilitators of AI Academy. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you. As we head into four weeks of learning together, we're kicking off with this one hour webinar from renowned teacher and speaker, Amanda Bickerstaff. Amanda is the co-founder and CEO of AI for Education. She's also the, a former high school biology teacher and ed tech executive with over 20 years of experience in the education sector. She has a deep understanding of the challenges and opportunities that AI can offer and is committed to helping schools and teachers maximize their potential through the ethical and equitable adoption of AI. And more than that, Amanda is truly a force. Her knowledge and understanding of AI is extensive and exacting. I hope that you'll learn a lot in this next hour, but I know I will. And now without further ado, please welcome Amanda Bickerstaff. Amanda, thank you so much for joining us today. The stage is yours. Hi, everybody. Well, welcome. Um, thank you for the beautiful um, introduction, Sean. I really appreciate that. And as you can see, I'm in a hotel room. Um, I tend to do this work uh, around the country and around the world. And so I'm in Austin today. I did a, a panel yesterday at South by Southwest EDU. So if anybody from Texas, I am in your state. Um, and we're going to have a lot of fun today. Like the ultimate goal is my job is to help you get onboarded and thinking about generative AI in a way that allows you to really think about how you're gonna apply this to your practice through this uh, wonderful uh, set of series that you're doing with Course Hero. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen um, and feel free if it ever, you can't see something. I love it when people tell me because sometimes technology is hard, but what we're gonna be looking at today is an introduction to generative AI. And so we're gonna do a lot of hands-on work. And so what I wanna do is set the scene. And so I know I can't see everybody, but you guys are starting your own community of practice within this group. And so I really want to make sure that you feel engaged and supported to do that. So the first thing is to get involved. Um, if you wanna chat with your fellow um, attendees, or the team at Course Hero, use a chat function. If you have a major question that you'd like me to answer, the chat, uh, please use a QA. and a um, And that way I can kind of keep track as I go along. I'll try to answer questions when I see them. Um, and we'll also have a little bit of time for questions at the end. Um, I also, we're going to be doing hands-on prompt engineering. So this is really exciting. So you're going to be using ChatGPT, the free version, to get started with our prompt library, um, whether you've never used ChatGPT before or are really thinking about how to apply this to your practice in a meaningful way, um, you're going to find something to keep you engaged. But I want you to make sure that you have, um, you're you going to prompt along with us. If you've not signed up for the free version of ChatGPT, this is a good time to do it. Um, so we will be using that in about 20 minutes. And then also, if you have any resources that you'd like to share as we go on, if you have a great idea, something that you've seen, please feel free to share it in the chat. And so what I'm going to do is I actually am going to ask you guys to be engaged. So I'm a former teacher, as um, was spoken. And so I have... Uh, you know, really care about engagement. Um, I've been in bad PD. I don't like doing bad PD. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, even though I can't see you, to take out your phone. Okay, so everyone has their phone here. I'm assuming you have it next to you. Um, this is the only time I'm going to ask you to take out your phone. I have an iPhone 15. It has not been broken yet, but give me time. Um, it's actually got a really nice, I don't know if everyone can see it, but that's uh, Mount Fuji. I was actually in Japan when ChatGPT was released. And so I have a nice phone. And the way that my phone recognizes my, like, and allows me into my phone and not other people is by creating a biometric signature of my face. And so the way that it does that is it essentially turns my face into a series of numbers that actually changes. So if I change my haircut or it's Movember and you might have a, a weird mustache, not that that ever happens, um, you know, it's going to be able to still open my phone for me. And so that's a form of artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence has been around since the 50s. And so we're talking about, you know, the first chatbot was in the 1960s. It's been around for a really long time. And in fact, 84% of us interact with artificial intelligence 
on the weekly. And so whether you have your phone like this, if you have your laptop, which you're on right now, you are using artificial intelligence all the time. And so while we might seem like we're suddenly talking about artificial intelligence and you see it everywhere, it's been something that's been a part of our lives and a part of instructional technology for you know decades. So what I want everyone to do, our first kind of way to interact is Please put into the chat what other forms of artificial intelligence, like what kind of apps do you have on your phone that use artificial intelligence? What do you think? And so I'm going to ask everyone to, so Alexa, so thank you, Cindy. So we have Alexa and Siri. Um, I, if I say, hey, Siri, I apologize if I turned on your phone. Um, yes, so absolutely. Um, hey, Siri, Alexa, Siri, hey, Google are all forms of artificial intelligence technologies. Um, they are going to use automatic speech recognition, which is called ASR. Um, they also are pretty good at doing a couple of things pretty well. So you might be able to ask them to set a timer. Uh, it'll tell you a joke, but it won't. It'll be like a pre bank of jokes. Your student, your kids might love that. Um, it's going to be able to tell you the news or play a song. And so those are examples of artificial intelligence. I also see. Um, like healthcare apps, absolutely. Things that are looking at like, um, you know, the way that you, um, like your health, you have many steps, et cetera. Those are going to be using artificial intelligence. Google and Waze and, and Maps are all great examples as well. Um, it's something that I live in New York City. And so sometimes my phone will tell me I need to leave three hours in advance because it thinks I'm walking. Um, so that's going to be an example of an artificial intelligence model within uh, Google Maps. Um, Facebook and um, other like tick who likes TikTok anybody I, it's always funny I'll ask people who likes TikTok as an educators only some people are honest and say yes but so TikTok um, you know Facebook Instagram they all have um, algorithms um, that are really great at uh, showing you that next corgi video if you're like my dad my dad loves corgis um, and so we have lots of really great examples here of um, of generative, of, excuse me, of AI writ large. Um, another one is predictive text. Um, so predictive text is a great, um, like a kind of a precursor to what generative AI is. And so the reason why we start here, and thank you everyone for getting so, um, so in and uh, open to communicating and sharing. And so our, like Charlotte's great question, how are we how are we actually defining AI? So artificial intelligence, we're gonna do a whole section in a moment. Artificial intelligence is the theory of, of computer science that is creating uh, technology that can do human-like things. So the ultimate goal of having it be able to do everything that a human can do and more. And so artificial intelligence is the large umbrella term. And we're gonna be talking specifically today about generative AI, but it's a good place to start because even though we're talking about it a lot now, it's something that's been taking you know decades to get to this moment in time. So the next thing I'm gonna ask everybody to do is um, I'm gonna, you guys are not in person, so I'm not gonna make you stand up. If you really wanna stand up and get a little bit, um, you know, get a little bit active, you're more than welcome. But if you think that this, what I say is a myth, please put an M in the chat. If you think it is a fact, please put an F. And so what we're gonna do is the first one I have is, we just talked about AI can think like humans. So is that a myth or a fact? And so this is great. I'll give everyone just a moment. So it looks like mostly we have myths, but we have a couple of facts. Um, and so this is a great way to start. And this is something that is a, a common um, misconception. But the idea that there is a, that AI or ChatGPT is thinking is a misconception. So AI is not thinking. What it is is it's computing. It's essentially a probabilistic model, meaning that it uses probabilities and math to be able to create things that have never been created before. Um, so it is something that is not thinking, it is computing. And I think this is a really important way to think about this. Artificial intelligence is a misnomer. Our, there are, is no intelligence in the way of um, uh, the way that we define intelligence in humans in technology at this stage. So it's really important to understand that when you use these tools, you are using technology. Um, you are acting essentially as a computer scientist. It's just a little bit different now. So instead of using code, you're using words, you're using natural language. And so you can ask it questions, you can even be polite. Um, but it's really important to understand that the way that we interact with these technologies is that they're still technologies. And so we want to make sure that we have that recognition, especially as we're working with students, is that if we have, if we think that it's Sometimes it can be a little bit uncanny where 
ChatGPT says, I'm sorry, or it has a first person. If you've used something like Poe or Inflection that have personalities intentionally, it can feel like these tools are thinking, but at this stage, they are not. They are still computing probabilities. So that's number one. Number two, AI is unbiased. What do we think? Myth or fact? Okay, so mostly myth again, we're seeing a couple of facts. And thank you guys for being so on it. Um, and so um, the uh, the ChatGPT and other tools, these large language models have been trained on the internet. Has anyone ever said the internet is an unbiased place? Um, and so Marina just said that um, AI models are designed and work because of all of the data that they ingest and, and start to be trained on. The internet, um, it can be pretty biased. We are biased the internet replicates our biases. And in fact, the majority of the internet is in English um, and even more in American English. And so what we see is that these technologies that are that are going to be like ChatGPT that are trained on the internet will carry these biases. And not only generative AI, but also like AI that has come before, like computer vision, the ability to like in this case, like look at my face. Yes, joy is amazing. Um, and so doing the work you know, five years ago or six years ago now on how facial recognition was really bad at recognizing non-white faces. And so I think that this is really where it gets interesting is that we've seen artificial intelligence be a fraught, it's biased in a pretty significant way. I don't know, did everyone see what happened with Google Gemini last week? Um, it's a, that's really interesting. So, um, some of us did. Um, I talked to someone from Google yesterday, um, and it is definitely what I would call a kerfuffle. Um, it was not great. Um, and so it's actually really easy to see bias in text to image generators. So if you've ever used Dolly or Gemini or Ideogram or other tools what in mid-journey, um, Sable Diffusion, to create an image, what it did is it was, you know, these text to image generators tend to be pretty biased where they'll really present white people, white men, white people. And so the way that we get around it usually is so for something like ChatGPT, Dolly 3, there is a hidden prompt that tells it to be diverse. And so when you ask it for, you know, a group of students, it'll give you a group of, of diverse students because it would, it's got that prompt in the background. Well, so Gemini, um, they at Google, they decided to try to do the same thing. It did not do a great job. And so what ended up happening is when you asked it for a founding father, it would give you an indigenous founding father. It would give you black and Asian um, Nazis if you asked for something from the 1940s. It was pretty bad. In fact, it was something in which it was almost impossible to create white people. And so what ended up happening is by trying to create the system that was and keep it from being less biased, they actually made it more biased. And so the reason why I say this is some of it is pretty aggressive. So if you saw that Gemini piece and if you want to do that research, it's pretty aggressive. You can see it right away. But there are also significantly larger, subtle differences in biases. For example, Wikipedia is considered one of them, like as a training data set that these tools are open to talking about. And 70% of Wikipedia editors are men. But more than that, there are the same number of pages in Swahili as Bhutan. Swahili is spoken by 80 million people. Bhutan spoken by 30,000. So you start to see that there are some implicit biases that are but not implicit, but like harder to see more nuanced biases. What you also see is that if you ask ChatGPT to give you two examples or two explanations of algorithms, one to a female group and one to a male group, what you'll see is the male group has got a very technical um, description and explanation. And and the female group is less technical and eventually talks about washing machines. Um, so apparently laundry, very important to women, um, but it's something that's really like, so is harder to see if you're not looking for it. So when you think about this for your own practice, it's very important to verify that the, the way that you're using these tools is not actually um, exacerbating bias and or replicating it. So it's something that's really important when you do your own work. Uh, the next piece is, okay, what do we think? AI development has reached its peak. What do we think? All right, this is where I think we are, there's a, a pretty good um, myth, um, probably not some, some questions. So um, the answer is definitely not. Um, and so um, the AI models that we have today, the generative AI models we have today are the worst they'll ever be. Yesterday was the worst, the, you know, we just talked about Gemini, it's worse yesterday, the worst tomorrow. 
These tools are very, very new. Generative AI in the current form is less than a year and a half old. And so if you think about the first time you used a cell phone, or I remember the first time I used Google Maps, or sorry, Apple Maps, it told me I was in the Hudson River. Or if you maybe remember that your you know, internet would dial up, you know, these tools take a long time to get really good. And so we have these models that are really new. And so they are going to be developing in, in a really fast rate. Um, and so... Uh, does anybody know the number one use case of ChatGPT and other generative AI tools? What do you think people use it the most for? What do we think? Um, anybody willing to put something in the chat? Selfies, code improvement, emails, um, cheating on their homework. Mitch, okay. I love how I always usually make that joke about please don't say cheating on your homework, even though you might be thinking it. I did see that Matt had this, uh, Matt got it right. So Matt, um, it is coding. So the the most like 35 to 40 percent of generative AI is actually used to create more code, more technology. So not only are we going to see an imp, like an, uh, a higher rate of generative AI development, like yesterday, Claude 3 coming out, which is a great writer. Um, what we're going to also see is that all technology development is going to improve because of the ability to create code with generative AI. So I won't spend too much time because we only have an hour together, but this is a great, if, you, if you're really into um, the nerdy stuff like we are, this is from Quotur. I'm happy to share this, this document with you all after this, um, uh, the research study, but this is a good example of what's happened. And so what you're going to see is we talked about how AI has been around for a long time and actually we've been trying to um, create technology to do handwriting recognition, speech recognition, like kind of the normal stuff, right? And it took decades. Look at this. So it took decades to get to human parity. Um, and so what we saw is that like this is something that you really like were trying to figure out. And, you know, it took a, quite a while to do that. We see something that's really interesting here where image recognition went up really fast. And what happened was it wasn't actually a really big change in the way that we compute. But if you've ever had, you know, hated your life, um, using a CAPTCHA where you're trying to find all those, oh my gosh, you know, all of those, you know, fire hydrants or motorcycles. And then you're like, am I actually a bot? I can't figure this out. We were actually training image generators uh, or image recognition. So that was really interesting. Um, we still do it. Or there's still other ways we do this. And so that's why they've changed. If you've ever seen one now where it's having you do different types of, you know, move this and like those are different ways of actually training models. But what we do see is that something happens here. I don't know if anybody's a Jeopardy fan. Um, and so Jeopardy is, you know, IBM Watson. So around 2016, IBM Watson beat Jeopardy. And so that's going to be like one of the first forms of generative AI that we had. And what we're going to see is we're going to start to see this opportunity of like how computing advanced and we're now able to do reading comprehension more quickly to parity and even better language understanding common sense completion, et cetera. So there's been a real revolution in our ability to do complex processing in the last decade. And that's led us to this moment in time. And so that's something to consider. Like what last thing I'll say is that the compute ability went so that between 2018 and 2020, if I was gonna fly from London to my home in New York City, it would on average take me about eight hours. The compute went up so much that that same flight would take 19 seconds. And that is two full years before ChatGPT was released. So we do see that this real revolution in compute, which has led us to this moment in time. Okay, next question. AI detection tools are effective. What do we think? So I love the somewhat. Um, if I asked you if you would, who would like these tools to, to be real? And I tend to get a different answer when someone, if I ask you if you'd like them to work. And unfortunately, um, this is a myth. Um, and in fact, I was on a panel yesterday with a AI scientist um, from Fine-Tune, and he, said, he talked about this live, is that we see that um, AI detection tools are are very unreliable. Not only do they have false positive rates of about 1%, let's say about 1%. Um, and so in the sense of they have, um, you know, out of 100, one essay or one piece will say it's AI generated when it's not. And then for there's about 15 to 20% that is going to be um, false negatives, meaning that students that are, or other people that are using it are using its AI so well that it gets past all AI detectors. And I actually see that Joe has put this into the chat. OpenAI had an AI detector and they sunsetted it back in July of last year. 
So ChatGPT does not know what ChatGPT wrote. And so this is something that's very, very important. Um, you can test this on your own. You can go ask ChatGPT to write something and then put it into another context window and ask it if it wrote it. It will not know. And so we see that, um, you know, we do still see Turnitin, GPT-0, and, and Copy Lake still have AI detectors. Um, but it is something, as we've been pointing out by Laura, is that we also have found that the, the research shows that it can be biased against non-native English speakers. And so if you're using, if you are thinking that, especially as an, an educator, that an AI detector is going to be reliable and part of your toolkit, you need to think again. There is no x-ray glasses, there's no magic bullet, there's no watermark. Um, that um, is going to tell you that something is AI detected, both in terms of imagery. Now, video, if you've seen Sora, Sora is crazy. Um, and that, you know, it's a video, it's a text to video editor. If you've been on TikTok, you've probably seen that. Um, and so there is definitely not going to be um, you know, any real way to do this. And in fact, like if you are catching, if these tools are catching AI cheating, usually what they're doing is catching bad AI cheating. And so last thing I'll say is, yeah, so uh, Joel, um, Julie, it's Sora, S-O-R-A, you're correct. Um, one of the other pieces is that Victor Lee has been doing a study at Stanford for the last 15 years about cheating in schools. And so they find that about 60 to 80% of high schoolers exhibit a, a cheating behavior, just in general. Um, and so what they did is they went back in 2023 thinking, okay, we've seen so many things change with ChatGPT. Let's see if actually the number and the amount of cheating has changed. And what they did is they found that actually the, the amount of cheating had not changed, but the type of cheating did change. And so this is something that is really interesting that those were cheating now are cheating with generative AI, where they might have been using a parent, uh, you know, photo math or, you know, Chegg, et cetera, to do that work. Um, and so Bill asked, are there human ways of detecting cheating with AI? I think knowing your students and knowing how they write and then being able to ask good questions, evaluative questions after that is a great way to do that with your students. I joke that sometimes your students with AI will come in and they it's like they lived in London for a month. They come back and like their writing suddenly it's got a you know British accent and they have like a little monocle. Like you, you know that that can change. And so you can work on that. But I will say that things like Grammarly Go and others are starting to learn student voice. And so what will happen is it can even deliberately add misspellings or other things. And so it's something that can still be like a student if they're putting enough effort in can still get past you and I, I we can talk about I don't have a lot of time with you all but there's some great anecdotes of students being a kind of challenged to use AI and like fully and then they had to learn how to use it to make it in their voice and I think it's a really fascinating critical thinking exercise but it does mean that like at this stage you should not be using AI detector in fact we believe very strongly that the first major legal case against AI in education will be against an AI detector and a school using it and so I think that's something that's just really important that instead of looking at trying to catch it it's looking at can you do better practice? Can you can you use it a way that you're either creating transparency with your students' use and or you're you know thinking of ways in which students are able to show their learning and proof of effort in different ways. Um, the last one is AI will replace many professions like doctors, lawyers, and teachers. What do we think? There we go. Okay. Pretty much missed all the way. So a couple of couple of facts. What if I changed it to AI will transform many professions like doctors, lawyers, and teachers? Yeah, that's the that that's an easy one to go in. And then that's the world we live in right now. Um, and so I think that this is where it gets really interesting. There's something called Amara's Law. And Amara's Law say that we tend to overestimate the current, like the, the short-term impact of technology. We tend to underestimate the long-term impact. And so what's happening right now is that you might have seen that Tyler Perry, you know, has gonna have an $800 million studio, you know, all this stuff, and he canceled it. And so we see that there are people getting laid off and there's been changes where people are like school, like not schools, but um 
companies and industry are thinking that this, this generative AI can replace people right now. And what they're going to find and what they are finding is that the technology is just not that good yet. And so exactly, Matt, this is related to the hype curve. There is there is a question about like where in this case that there are places in which you're definitely seeing augmentation. But what's going to happen, though, is it's going to take a lot of time before we start to see the idea of real replacement. And so right now, for example, for doctors, if you're a radiologist, what do you do every day? You are going to read, you know, you're going to read MRIs and CAT scans and you're going to diagnose. And what they find is that right now there are already AI models that are at human parity and sometimes better that can do that. But what's the difference between a radiologist and a bot is that the radiologist is limited to the number of MRIs that the, and CAT scans they can review a day. So this is actually one of the first kind of major white collar jobs, high skilled, high paying, that is at risk of real transformation with AI. But right now what we're looking for and we're thinking about is the idea of augmentation. And so augmentation is really going to be what we're going to focus on and what we're going to want to, to do. And so right now, I don't know if everyone has been in a uh, you know, around long enough to know that we've been, we're going to be replaced as teachers with, I remember back 20 years ago, it was going to be computers and internet. Um, and so what we want to do is actually look at this idea of like how this is going to augment our practice. But I would say that no one's job is at risk anytime soon. Um, and I see that the chat is going off really, really well on some ideas about rethinking assessment and all those different pieces. I know that will most likely be something that you guys will be doing with um, the, the rest of the time that you have. And so I think it's a great opportunity to discuss. And I love that. So um so there we go. Okay, so what I want everyone to do now, um, we're going, <laughs> we're going to do our first prompt together. And I know that you probably have used uh, ChatGPT before, which is great. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to go to ChatGPT. So I'm going to just drop this into the chat because I want you to get it exactly how I write it. So I'm going to go to ChatGPT now. And um, can everyone see that I have a different window up? Um, Thank you, Lorna. I appreciate the feedback. Uh, I have a bad habit of not realizing. Um, okay, so this is my this is my ChatGPT. I have the paid version. Um, still, um, you know, like I still believe, and all the research shows that GPT four, even though it is paid, is going to be the um, the highest caliber model. Um, you can see that plugins are going away, but now I can't see my screen. So let's try to get around that. Okay, so I have ChatGPT four the paid version, but we're going to be using GPT 3.5. You can also do it on four if you would like, um, but we'll be doing all of our prompting together on the free version because it's so important for us to have access to this. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop that into the chat. Um, and I want to, I want everyone to tell me, not everyone has to, um, what did you get? And you can see right now that mine is absolutely different than Mitch's. Uh, Megan's longer, Abby's is longer. They have some definitely um, different, like they have some things in common, right? Mine is very much like, what do you want? <laughs> like, give me what you want. And so what we're going to see here is actually, oh, that was like, thank you for asking. Okay, so what we're going to see, this is our first lesson for today on how generative AI works. And so we talked about this, but what we have here is it's called a context window. And a context window is going to be how we create new like new outputs. So the way that this works is that the model itself that underlines ChatGPT is taking all of its training data and the way it's been trained and fine-tuned, plus the way that I ask it a question, it's creating something brand new. But what you can see is that we have, you know, a hundred and plus people in here and no one has the same answer. And the reason why is it's something called temperature. So I'll put that into the chat. So temperature, I can actually ask it, what is uh what does temperature mean? in a generative AI model. So I'll put that in and ask. And so it's a parameter that controls the randomness of the generated text. And so I think of it as level of variability. So if something has a low temperature, it's going to be very precise. In fact, it'll be almost like existing classical AI that does one thing pretty well. And if it's a high temperature, oh man, then it'll be like crazy. Sometimes it could be like all in emojis or like it could be really weird and creative. And so the way that these models are, are um, are designed is to have a level of variability 
that allows you to keep being creative, it being creative. And so I can keep asking questions. I can ask for 50 lesson plan ideas. I can use this as a thought partner and a creative partner. But if you are expecting that you got a prompt to work exactly like you wanted to, and you're going to be able to cut and paste that prompt using it with students or using it for your own practice, then you need to recognize that it will be different. If I ask the same question in another another context window, I'm going to always open another context window when I want to start something. What we're going to see, well, that didn't, there we go. It's that you can see um, automatically this is a different answer. So we have two completely different answers that I'm getting in my own personal thing. So it's very important to recognize that the way that these tools work is that they are going to have a level of, of variation that's going to have a lot of creativity, but it is something that it's going to have a lot of unpredictability as well. So that's one of our first um, lessons for today. The context window is really interesting. It can like essentially it can work in the free version about 16 pages of content. And then what we can do is I can have a conversation back and forth. ChatGPT uh, is rolling out memory where it can start to remember your work across the different chats, but right now most people do not have it. So just think of it as this is the, if you want to have a conversation and have it be something that remembers what you've done, you do it in a context window and that's going to be this context window. So what I want everyone to do now is I want you to take a bit of time and I want you to try one of these two prompts. And so I'm going to drop these into the chat. So prompt one is around working with students with dyslexia. Feel free if you're working with students with aphasia or dyscalculia or something along those lines. And then 10 strategies for engaging a student that becomes discouraged when work is challenging. And what I want you to do is I want you to put this into a new context window and you want to try it out. The most important thing to do though is not just look at the output and say yes or no. Like I I want you to I want you to actually get and work with this to see if there's something that you like, something that you want to change. And I want you to prompt with it. So you don't just use one prompt, but you keep prompting. So everyone's going to have about like, let's say three to four minutes to try this out. Um, I'm actually going to do one live if you want to kind of follow along, but please like this, try this out on your own piece. And then let's like the ultimate goal is like starting to use these tools and get comfortable with this. So yeah, so Joel, like you can, I'll show you, it's like you can, if you, I really like the fifth um, activity or strategy, like, can you make that into an activity plan? Like the idea is like actually keep using it. So in this case, like describe some things and so some common ways. And so reading difficulties, writing difficulties, phon phonological awareness. And what I can do now is I can say to um, create, you know, provide more detail On, num on attention difficulties. What I can do is that's how, that's okay. If, if it's going, this is a little bit too fast. I totally understand. So what I would suggest is, um, you know, you can join us when you can. What we want you to do is just try this out. So we'll have plenty of opportunities to do this. And Joe or others, if you want to use it on different tools, you can do that. Um, if you've never used Claude.ai is also a good tool if you want to, to play around. But for those of us that are brand new, we just want to get familiar and comfortable with prompting. Yes, and so you cannot change temperature. You, even if you ask to change temperature within your prompt, it doesn't work that way. The prompt happens, the temperature happens at the model level. So if you're using it through the, the library API, then you can do that. So to go to prompting, you want to just go to ChatGPT, is, and then you're going to go to an open, so if you go up to the top, if you can see my cursor, and then what you do is here, this is where you put your prompt. So you can put your prompts here. So there we go. And you, what you'll automatically see is that this is a different set of answers than what I had before. It's actually significantly more robust in terms of the descriptions. And so again, that's that idea of variation that happens within the model itself. So as you guys are, are kind of playing around and if you're just getting started, there'll be plenty of time to do this work together. Um, but the idea here is that one of the most important pieces and even with a prompt that's very, very simple is that what you're gonna start to see is this this opportunity to start really getting deep and, and having a conversation with technology 
to get to an output that's going to work for your use case. And so in this case, I can now start to really move and shift and ask. I can even say, okay, now create um, a set of uh, tips and strategies for my students that have issues with organization and time management. So there we go. So what I can do now is I see how I've started to work with this. Um, and so there's some really good questions in the chat. So we'll definitely take a moment to kind of discuss what this looks like. Um, and we'll do some, we're gonna do a little bit of tech talk that could also help. Um, and that's awesome, Cindy. Like, yeah, this is what we want. We wanted to get to kind of get really cool. So the idea of that the algorithm changes because of how we're interact with things, that does not like it does not impact how many times people use this tool or what they're asking, because every context window is going to be a unique conversation. And so you don't need to like that's we're not shifting the model at all based on these conversations. Um, and when we talk about OpenAI, OpenAI is the company that built ChatGPT. So they're the company that built it. So when we talk about ChatGPT, that is the product that they have built. Um, and so for, and we'll, we'll definitely do, um, yeah, so th there are lots of other models that use OpenAI. So if you've got Dolly or so Sora or others, they're going to be all created by OpenAI. And in fact, I saw some conversation about Copilot and Copilot is Microsoft. It is going to be run essentially mostly through ChatGPT's model. So it's actually using OpenAI, its model to run Copilot if you have that on your phone. So we're gonna we're gonna go, okay, so these are all great questions. So what we're gonna actually do is we're gonna go back into our presentation um, and we're gonna have a conversation about the technology. So a lot of the questions that we're starting to get, which is awesome, and I love that everyone's heads are going so much to this, is about like how to actually think about the technology. Um, and so this is where I think Kevin, like hold that thought. These are, this is, we're gonna actually talk about how we can think about this work and like what prompting, how prompting matters. So what I'm gonna do is, this is actually something that you can find on our website. We have a whole host of free resources. So you're feel more than welcome. Um, we'll make sure this is in the, um, the follow-up, but I will actually um, put our website into the chat right now. Um, and so there we go. Um, and so what we have here is that artificial intelligence we talked about is going to be the 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 frame, the 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 theory. And it's something that was uh, first coined in 1950s. We talked about the first chat bot was in the 1960s and she was called Eliza. And it was a mental health chat bot that was not very good. But what she would do is if you said, I have a bad day, she would respond, you've had a bad day. And people actually liked it. It was something that they felt comfortable talking to a bot for that. But artificial intelligence, what mostly what we thought about with artificial intelligence, and we talked about our phone, like protective text and others, is something called machine learning. So machine learning is essentially where we took lots of data and we created a, a model, a machine learning model that did one or two things really well. So for example, if you use Spotify or you use Pandora, it would be able to recommend a song. Um, if you did predictive text, it would be able to complete a sentence. Um, if you looked at Quill, if anybody's used Quill, which is a writing assessment, sorry, a writing assistant, it has it had 200 machine learning models to be able to support student writing. So one for you know, using a period, an exclamation point, active and passive voice. So what it was, is we had a lot of these machine learning models that were actually really quite, um, you know, expensive to create and sometimes impossible to create because we just not get enough data. And so it's something that like was really interesting because we want to like technologists are moving towards creating um, tools that can do what humans can do, but faster and better. So what they did is they looked at the brain. So about 20 years ago, they started looking at the brain and looking how the brain works. And they created an idea of uh, a, a series, excuse me, a, a theory called deep learning that mimics the way the brain works with neural networks. And so not so important to understand that completely, but the transformer model is actually the, the technology that underpins chat GBT. And so when you think of chat GBT, GPT is transformer. And so um, what we see there is that that was where we saw all of those amazing opportunities for advancement that has led to generative AI. And that generative AI is when we're going to use training data 
and your input to create things that are brand new. So text, audio, images, or video, um, coding, et cetera. So what we're gonna be talking about today is really, and we've been talking about is generative AI. And so you, the generative AI is again, that ability to take training data and your input to create something new. Um, and so in, in the case of the next piece, what we have here is like the way that these tools work there. We talked about that they're probabilistic uh, models. So they are creating essentially a vision of like how words work together through the training data set. And so we have here is that um, we have the prediction of the sky is the next common word would be blue. If you look at the internet and most people would say blue. But if you're looking at like Chicken Little, the book, it would be falling. And so the way that this works is that words are essentially mapped and, and they are turned into numbers and then they are essentially related to each other. And that's how these tools work is that they are predicting the next word. And so when you ask ChatGPT to build you, to answer even the question, what are you ChatGPT? It is predicting the next best word based on what you've asked it and it's training data. And that's really important. If you're using a image generator, it's predicting the next pixel. So that's why if you see an image generator build, it actually goes from very blurry to very crisp because what it's doing is actually pick, it's actually predicting the next pixel until it gives you that image. And that's going to be really important to understand because if you ask it, if you ask ChatGPT a very generic question, you will get a very generic output. So there were a bunch of questions about the idea of like why, you know, you know, how it gave you the output and the idea that change when you change what this like it was a Bible student, a, a teacher, a lecturer, it would give you different answers. And the reason being is that the way that we ask questions really changes the output. And so that idea of prompting is going to be really important. So the way that I ask a question, the way that you ask a question of the technology really matters the way that we prompt. And so we're going to do the last bit of little technology we're going to do is this idea of the way that these technologies work. So you understand why it's so important to be specific in your prompting. And that the reason is we talked about how you have text from the internet that comes in to the transformer. It then takes it into a place and it creates connections between words. And then it goes into the model like ChatGPT has got a model underpinning it. And what happens is because AI, generative AI is not thinking, it does not know right from wrong, appropriate from inappropriate, and it has to be trained and reinforced to be able to do that. And so in this case, like all of these technologies have been checked by people to say, okay, appropriate and inappropriate. And what ends up happening is the results are fed back into the model and then they're released. And this is very, very important. Um, so we talked about how important it is to prompt, but it's also really important to understand that these models have a knowledge cutoff. So if I go to ChatGPT right now and I ask it a question, when is your knowledge cut off? You can do this on your own as you want. What it says is it's January, 2022. So ChatGPT, the free version, does not know that Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift are dating. Um, and so that's a, a tragedy, but it also doesn't know, let's say that your standards that you're using like in Ontario, have changed. And so this idea that there is a knowledge cutoff, and so I can even ask it, who is Taylor Swift dating? And what it'll say, they don't, it's the knowledge cutoff, we don't know. And so this is something that's really important is that these technologies are not like connected to the internet, especially conversational AI at all. ChatGPT 3.5 is not connected to the internet. And even if I use ChatGPT 4, it's actually not going to be connected to the internet either, unless I ask it. So I can just say, do your research. Who is Taylor Swift dating? And what it's going to do now is going to search Bing, but I've had to ask it to do, this is the, the paid version. And so what it's doing is it's now giving us Kansas City. <laughs> and so this is something, and you can see the citation that's going to give us a New York Post article. Oh, goodness. Um, and so this is the idea, though, that these tools, but if I ask ChatGPT right now, because it's, its knowledge base has been updated, but if I ask again, oops, sorry, I can't find it. What is your knowledge cut off? And it's going to say April 2023. It's actually been updated. See, this is, this is a hallucination. It's actually wrong. It's actually been updated December, 2023. So if you try it out, so that's when someone had a question as well, is that what, what happens when it's incorrect? And so in this case, 
what are hallucinations? Okay, so we just saw a hallucination because ChatGPT 4 has an update to December 2023 and it's wrong. And I know a couple of people had stumped ChatGPT in your, your, uh, the work that we did. And so I hope you enjoy this meme. But essentially, the way that these models work is that they're, they don't know right or wrong, right? But what they do is they make up stuff all the time. They're always making up what they think, what, what the model thinks is the best next word. And so it's always hallucinating, which is a term from technologists, but that's when it's, when it's wrong. It's, it's creating a fabrication. And so in this case, if I, when I went back and I asked about, you know, it's knowledge cutoff, it was wrong, is a hallucination. And so that's something that happens a lot. And for example, things like word count, if I ask ChatGPT to do a word count, it's not actually a calculator or word counter. So it will give you a word count, but it will be incorrect. Um, and so that's something to consider is that there are a lot of opportunities. We talked about bias and now we've talked about hallucinations where it does make things up is that it's so important for us to consider that we need to be critical users of the technology, both as teachers, but also with our students. I, I'm definitely not advocating to go back to pen and paper because these are great tools for students and we've seen that happen a lot, but it is important for us to understand these technologies are not thinking, they are computing and they will make mistakes. And some of these mistakes are very, very subtle and hard to find unless you're an expert or looking for it. So that's something to consider. Um, we're just going to do a couple of more things before we're going to go questions. I know we have a ton of questions. There are four types of generative AI that you can see. We have conversational AI is what we're using now, which means that you interact through a conversation. The way that you prompt and ask questions matters. Um, we've got generative search, like perplexity, that allows you to connect search and generative pieces. It's really great. Multimodal AI can create images and uh, coding and video. We talked about Sora today. And then also AI writing assistants. So I don't know if everyone saw, but Grammarly now has, uh, it used to be just traditional AI, but now it has generative AI. And so those are other forms of generative AI. Um, the last thing we'll say is that for ChatGPT, this is a good example of like, and we're ha I'm happy to give you guys the copy of this slide, but this is something, if you want to take a screenshot, is really good. This idea of what ChatGPT is and isn't is going to be really important. And so ChatGPT is not capable of human thought. Instead, it's just an algorithm, a set of data and, and training that mimics human expression. Um, so it isn't thinking. The second it is not, we just saw it. It does not, it's not receiving live updates from the internet, especially in the free version of ChatGPT. The, the um, paid version, you'd have to ask it to be able to do um, that research, but it's also a closed data set, meaning that it's like an encyclopedia. And then encyclopedia is published, that, 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 that information stops. It's the same thing with models. They all have a knowledge cutoff. The next is it's not a search engine. So if you're using it like, I'm gonna ask it a question, I'm gonna get an answer, it's gonna be perfect. It's not the way that this works. Instead, it's a tool for actually engaging and in, in thought partnering and augmenting what you do. And it's really great for that thought partnering. And this last thing is not a calculator. In fact, if you're a math teacher, um, you can try it out. It doesn't do math particularly well. It's the thing it does the least good, um, but it can do data analysis if you use it with the paid version, but it's not going to be able to give you a word count or a calculator. And so the last piece I'll do before I give you guys some resources, and I know we're running out of time, is we have a chat some tips. And so the way that we think about it, whether you're using, uh, now BART is Gemini, but if you're using ChatGPT or Claude, um, that these are really great brainstorming partners. And so we talked about that level of variation or variability. It's really, really good at giving you lots of great ideas. We used it today to name a webinar um, because we were stumped and we asked it for like, you know, 50 names and we came up with a good name based on that. But it's a great opportunity to have a brainstorming partner. So if you're thinking about your next lesson or you're thinking about even like a meal plan for yourself, use ChatGPT. You can converse back and forth and you can get to something that's really quality in a much shorter period of time. And that leads us to that 80-20% 80-20 rule. You can put in a lot less effort to get a lot more reward now, but it still is going to require you getting in there and knowing how to prompt. And I know you're going to be doing that work with the team here at Course Hero in more detail, but it is something that is really important, though. It still requires your thoughtfulness, your creativity, your resilience. It's not always going to work right the first time, but it's going to be something that if you use it, well and often, it can really support your instructional planning in ways that you can create a rubric in 10 seconds. And we'll actually we'll actually use that as our last piece. So, you know, we're going to just look at our prompt library. So I'm gonna I'm gonna place this into the um, chat. 
hold on one second. Let me get this open. So this is our prompt library. And this is fully free. And you're more than welcome to use this um, whenever you want. Um, and so this is the prompt library. It's on our website. Um, and we have over 100 prompts from everything from like so if you're an administrator, if you're doing assessment, communication, like we have quizzes, rubrics, et cetera. And so we're actually going to look at our rubrics piece now. And so I'm going to drop this into the chat and we're just going to do it together because this is actually my first ever prompt before I started AI for Education. And what we do is this prompt library. We talked about how prompts are the way that you ask questions of ChatGPT and other tools. You can use this on Gemini. You can use this on Claude. Is we have an example of what you can you, you can cut and paste. And you can change. So I can put a new topic, grade level, assignment description. And then you also have an example prompt that you can just cut and paste. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just cut and paste this in and I'm going to put it into ChatGPT. I'm going to open a new context window always. I'm going to turn to the free version, open a new context window, and I'm going to drop that in. And so what we have here is I think that someone noticed this already, that if you give it a, a role to take, in this case, you're an expert teacher and curriculum writer, skilled in assessing student work, that actually helps you get a better output because what we're doing is we're giving it a very specific role to take. Um, and what we want to do is create a rubric for my fifth grade science class. It should be um, a five point scale and it should be formatted as a chart. And so, you know, a pretty good prompt. We think it's a good prompt. It's thoughtful. It's specific. It has exactly what we want. And what I've been able to do now is I've been able to create a five point rubric with design, durability, effectiveness, presentation, explanation. And so this is really interesting because this would take me probably 45 minutes to an hour to do a rubric. And what I'm going to see is that actually, I, I think that at this stage, um, add a section, it's not quite right, on, let's say, teamwork. Um, make the language more simplified for my fifth grade students. I think it's too advanced. And create uh, and shift to a four point scale. So what I can do now is what I'm doing um, is here we go. So it's changed it to a four point scale. I've added, it's, it's you see how it's simplified the language. I have then added teamwork and it's a four point scale. And so what we see here is that through my prompting, we talked about how prompting, giving it feedback is really important. And so you might have not done a rubric sometimes because you've run out of time or it's just a like competing priority. But what also I want us to think about, and as you do this, is starting to think about not just what you would do normally, but what you could do now. Because we don't want this to just reinforce existing practice, but now I can say create three tip sheets for, students that struggle getting started, two students that had an egg, an egg breakage, and three students that are having trouble working as a team. So those are three kind of common things we see in this. And so what I have now is a tip sheet for the students that are struggling to get started. So break down the task, brainstorm ideas, ask for help. I want on get the egg breakages, like what happened, identify weak points, learn from your mistakes, make adjustments. And then for having trouble, listen to others, share ideas, compromise. But what you can see now is that's when, um, like it is something that this is like where I think I want you all to get in terms of this like work you're doing today. Um, and I think that this is where I think if we could do this work where we would normally stop at a rubric, right? And and I have to tell you, I hate rubrics. And so I'm so glad that this exists. But ex to Tanya's point and others is that the prompting matters, but also can we actually shift? And so we, instead of stopping at the rubric, how can we actually help kids better? How can we use this in a way in which you can do this and actually reinforce your good practice, but then push you to actually create something that's better for your students. And so this is something that's really just so important. The last thing I'll say before we go to the piece is that I have one more thing for you, and I'm actually going to prop this in the channel, but we have a prompt framework that is how we build all of our prompts. And so if you want to use this, we also have a student version, but if you want to use this to start building your own prompting techniques, you can do this through, you know, the way that we have this here. So I'll pop this into the chat. So you have it, it's all on our website. And in fact, before we go into the last piece, 
is that um, here's like how to get in touch with us. We have our prompt library. We have a, another course that if you ever wanted to do more than what you're doing amazingly right now, we've got a newsletter and other pieces. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to come off share. And I know we have about six minutes left, so it's not a ton of time to answer questions. Um, but I'm going to answer some questions that you guys all have. And thank you all for being such an engaged group. I love how you've interacted with each other as well. I think it's so great to see that. You guys are going to do such a great job in this course because you already have such a wonderful um, vibe. And I think that's super cool. So I'm just going to drop, before I answer a question, I'm just going to drop um, our prompting guide into the, the chat. So you have that to kind of support your practice um, as you go forward. So I'm just going to copy the link and I'm going to drop it into our chat. There you go, everybody. Okay, so I'm going to go. Um, and so we're going to, I'm going to answer. Okay. Um, what is the, um, okay, so Mary has a question about watermarking text. Um, there's, no, this isn't, this is something that is not, like there's a watermarking images so right now, if you create a Dali image with OpenAI or a mid-journey image in the metadata, it'll say that it's been created by the model, but that can be removed. But as far as watermarking uh, actual content, like text, no one has that figured out yet. Um, so sorry, Mary, <laughs> not going to be possible yet. Um, so we have a robots question. I, th I might like Lazarus. I might be a little bit hard for me to answer right now, just because I want to keep this on 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 task and what we're doing. Um, Lorna had a good question about Gemini versus ChatGPT. Um, Gemini is really interesting. I have a, I have really high hopes from uh, for Gemini because it is multimodal, so it actually can respond to you in text and image, and it can also understand text and image, which is really great. I think with any new model, including the fact that Claude just came out, there's just a lot of time that it needs to settle. And so there's a lot of work that happens. These are essentially big experiments, everybody. Um, you, We are the guinea pigs of these experiments. But so when a new model comes out, like Gemini, you'll see some mistakes and some things that don't work. But I think in a couple months, what we should see is that these tools work better. And I will be, we will be using Gemini um, with our trainings and our, and especially in schools that have Google, but not until we feel confident that it's going to act and it's going to actually be a complimentary tool to chat GBT. So thank you for that question. Um, for Matt, um, so uh, how do I best teach how to use LLMs technologists? So I'm gonna, I'm, we're gonna, we're gonna have a lot of time for that. So Matt, I'm not gonna be able to prompt anymore. So Leslie, we talked about those hallucinations. That was a great, um, a great question. So hallucinations do happen a lot. And so what we have to do is we have to be really cognizant of, of how we use the tools. I will actually just show you all one more thing before we go, which is, um, I, I'm not sharing, am I? I'll just share, share one more one more thing before we go, which is um, perplexity. Um, and perplexity is a generative search term and I'll drop this into the chat. And so we talked about that as an example. And so generative search is going to actually lower hallucinations because it's combining the internet and searching with technology and with, with generatives. Um, so if I ask you a question now, provide five uh, resources for a lesson on mitosis, And here we go. And so I now have an answer with resources. And now I have the, here we go. So now I have the connection here, really easy to find. And so we have this opportunity to do this. And so you can start to see that this is a way to lower hallucination. So if you asked it, you know, why did the war of 1812 start? which is something that like you might want to ask ChatGPT or a student might, but it's going to give you, it's, it potentially could hallucinate. Now it, not, it gives you these answers, but it also gives you links out to different resources to be able to double check that this work is correct. So that's a really great tool for, I, I think it's great for teachers building you know lessons and it's also great for students and you can feel more confident in the answers. Um, Taligan asked about parameters. Yes, ChatGPT4 is a one trillion, well, they think it's one trillion parameters. And that's the way the little, all those little adjustments. So, um, you know, right now, um, these tools don't work like the brain works. And so like, I think this is something that's really important to understand is that 
while these tools are becoming more and more advanced and they can do things that we could do and even things we can't, um, they don't work like the brain. They don't learn like the brain. They don't work like the brain. But the ultimate goal of these technologies is to build something that can do what humans can do, but better. So think about like data from Star Trek or Skynet if you're having a bad day. So that's kind of the ultimate goal of these companies that are building. But right now, it's, it's you know, these tools are, are still like really, really new and they don't always work as expected. So it's just something that we, we don't know that the, the last estimation is that, you know, it could be five to 10 years before we see something like artificial general intelligence, but there's really not a good idea of that. So I think we're, we've run out of times, I think for everybody, I know you all have such an important you know, jobs and lives and everything that you're done. And so I think it's just been a really great time. I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions, but I think that there's an opportunity to keep that discussion going at Course Hero with your team. Um, the Everything will be recorded. I'll make sure to follow up with uh, the team to make sure that you all have the resources. I'm sorry we don't share the slides only because it's our kind of proprietary information. So we don't, we don't share them, but I can share some of the resources. And if you have any specific questions, always happy to. And just also like, we're here for you, like connect. I'm on LinkedIn guys. If you ever want to see a whole bunch of stuff on LinkedIn, um, I, I am totally there. And we also have a women in AI education group. So feel free to reach out to me, but I just want to say thank you so much to the Course Hero team. I'm sure you guys are there. Um, thank you so much, Sean and Lale. Like it's been great. And I just appreciate you having me here today. Yeah, thank you so much, Amanda. This was absolutely, I mean, you're seeing it all in the comments, but I mean, people just, this was amazing. Um, I learned so much. I can't believe you can pack this much into an hour. It's amazing. It's a lot. Sorry, everybody. It was a little, it's, I try to, an hour is a little bit shorter than we do normally. So I apologize if it was a little bit too quick, but I know you guys have the record. Okay. They could always go back. Yeah, no, I think it's fantastic. So I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're on tour right now. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, and just a reminder to everybody who's still in the audience, um, we do have uh, our community hours coming up Wednesday and Friday this week, so uh, we can sort of all together digest some of the stuff that we, we learned today. So um, thank you again so much. Thanks, everybody. Have a really good day.